Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another edition of View on Africa. Today's discussion will be on the recent developments that are taking place in Burundi. Um, we, I want to start with a, a quick uh, summary of um, the recent developments. Um, as you know, the past few weeks have been uh, quite hectic for the country. Uh, there's been increased in uh, insecurity in the country. There has also been an increase in uh, international um, involvement uh, and regional actors wanting to regain a certain level of momentum um, to push the government and the opposition uh, to, uh, to mediate and to come to the negotiation table. So some key dates that are important to remember, um, the first one, of course, is October 17th. Uh, the African Union Peace and Security Council um, took many by surprise by issuing one of the strongest worded uh, communique uh, since the beginning of the Burundian crisis. And in this communique, um, they called very forcefully for a genuine and inclusive dialogue uh, between the government and the opposition, and uh, also put on the table for the first time this possibility of sanctions for individuals on each either side of the of the conflict, um, should violence escalate, uh, and if they were to be uh, found to be responsible for violations of human rights, there has also been uh, in this particular communique uh, more specifics on potentially um, deploying forces uh, and standby forces in in Burundi. Um, this communique came around the time that, um, and following um, a series of targeted assassinations, um, the, the death of the son and the son-in-law of uh, Pierre Claver Boniva, uh, uh, civil society organization leader, uh, and around the time of the death of an MSD leader also. Uh, it's very interesting from this communique the fact that Dr. Dlamini Zuma had been since the very beginning of the crisis very vocal about the need for mediation and, and her opinion with regards to um, the elections which she qualified as flawed um, in Burundi. But the PSC had used um, a much more nuanced approach when, when discussing um, the situation. And I, I, maybe I shouldn't say nuanced, but it was much more careful uh, in addressing the crisis. What they did, they had done recently, was the uh, deployment of human rights observers uh, from the EU and military experts. But we had very little information on what they were actually doing on the ground, uh, given the fact that um, the MOU between the African Union and the, Bur the Burundian government had not been signed. Another uh, development was that on the 23rd of that month, the 23rd of October, um, the government um, engaged in a swearing-in swearing ceremony of the Commission for Inter-Burundian Dialogue. The following day, we saw a joint press release uh, from the team of Envoy of the Great Lakes Region, um, which was composed of um, the, this particular committee of the UN Special Envoy, Mr. Jinnit, uh, the AU Special Envoy, Mr. Uh, Ibrahim Fall, uh, the US Special Envoy, um, the EU Special Coordinator, and the Be Belgian Special Envoy. And their press release um, endorsed the AU communique, which came out on the 17th. Um, this happened as the government approached the deadline of November 7th, um, telling the population that they had to voluntarily disarm. And after that date, security forces would then be engaged in an enforceable disarmament of the population. But before this, um, this deadline passed, um, there were some very interesting statements that came from key government officials in Burundi. Uh, of course, there was a secret recording of the president of the Senate, uh, Riverien Di Curillo, um, who made some statements that were reminiscent of, of um, some of the language that was used in the Rwandan genocide. Of course, the government came back and tried to explain that the, 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 the speech had been mistranslated, misinterpreted, but it 
it come it um, it brought some concerns from the international community, particularly that following his remarks a few days later, um, the Minister of Public Safety, uh, Mr. Bunioni, also came with a, a, a very interesting remark, saying that. Um, most of the opposition is taking place and, and the, 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 the violence and the instability is taking place in key neighborhoods um, that are predominantly Tutsi and that if security forces were not able to take care of the situation, then the, the, the country had 9 million inhabitants that would be able to, to, to act, which of course created a lot of fear um, in the population and at the international level. Uh, the international community condemned such rhetoric and we saw many neighborhoods, uh, some of those key neighborhoods, um, seeing an exodus of population, people packing their things and fleeing these areas. Um, so as the, the, the deadline approached, uh, France called for a UN Security Council meeting, which was to be held on Monday the 9th, following that weekend of disarmament. Um, of course, this was a PR nightmare for the, for the government, um, which then um, ensured the international that no massacres would take place um, and also invited AU observers to uh, take place or at least to, 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 to observe uh, the disarmament process. A colleague and I were in Bujumbura uh, that particular weekend um, as everyone expected the worst. Um, there were no um, confrontations between insurgents and security forces the weekend of the disarmament so we can say that for all intents and purposes, the disarmament took place relatively peacefully. There was an attack in a bar in Kenyosha that weekend that was not necessarily related to the disarmament. Um, but I think this was an indication that um, on one hand, uh, the government was fully aware that the international community was uh, paying attention to what was going on um, in, in Burundi. Um, but I also think it, it indicates this hesitance to to use violence when everyone is, is watching on the part of the government. Before that weekend, there was an attempt in the government to reshuffle some key positions in the army. And as you know, the army has been trying to remain um, as a, a neutral force uh, and not necessarily get involved in, in, in confrontations between the population and the security forces. And there was an attempt to um, to, to, to reshuffle some key po positions in the army to see if the army could get a little bit more involved. Um, and I think this, this remains a key point. The army remains a neutral force for the most part. Um, it has been involved in the past few days a lot more given the increased um, and the intensified attacks from armed elements of the opposition against security forces, uh, which I think needs to be highlighted, pointed out, and, and condemned at this point. Um, so all this to, to say, um, what followed the next Monday, of course, was um, as uh, the, the disarmament took place relatively peacefully, um, is the fact that the UN met um, and still issued, a, a, you know, worked on a resolution. Um, and the resolution, of course, supported the African Union communique and emphasized the spirit and the letter of Arusha. And I will come back to this wording because it comes back in a lot of the documents that we've seen coming from the uh, European Union, the African Union, and the United Nations. Um, this particular resolution also talked about potential sanctions and another avenue for potential armed presence uh, of the international community uh, by taking troops possibly from the DRC. Um, to bring them into Burundi. And another point that's important is while the resolution from the UN did not threaten the government with ICC um, cases, it did remind the government of its um, ICC obligations. Um, and I think that the, the, the mentioning of the ICC was very, um, was part of the, the reasons why um, the government chose to de-escalate the, the, the situation prior to the disarmament. There have been threats from the ICC um, and, and caution raised about um, uh, you know, people being indicted if, 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 if violations of human rights and crimes against humanity were perpetrated by people in the government. Um, so as uh, you know, the, the European Union is also another actor which I think we should, we should mention here. Um, at the end of this month, um, the Burundian government will have to respond to an invitation from the European Union 
uh, to negotiate based on Article 96 of the Cotonou Protocol. And this, this, particular, um, this particular document in Article 96 calls for the reevaluation of AU, e, excuse me, EU, European Union cooperation with said countries um, if um, there's a sense that um, human rights violations become pervasive uh, in such a crisis. And unlike um, other calls for mediations, um, this particular um, mediation called by the European Union comes with very specific benchmarks. Um, and if those benchmarks are not met, the European Union as a body would then reevaluate the type of cooperation it would have with the Burundian government, suspending some of their funding to the government, um, but not necessarily all. Um, but it will also um, theoretically uh, bring uh, all other EU countries who are cooperating with Burundi to suspend some of their assistance, um, or at least encourage them to reevaluate them. And some of these benchmarks are, are very specific, such as disarmament of, um, of, of armed groups, including the Mburinakure, um, or at least the, the, the section of the Mburinakure that is believed to be armed, and um, armed rebel groups. Um, it would uh, call on assuring the protection of human rights defenders and journalists. Um, it would also uh, you know, call for trans clear steps to bring more transparency to the security forces. And here we're talking about the intelligence services and the police who have been accused of engaging in, in human rights violations. Um, there would also be uh, calls to restrain from inciting ethnic hatred and divisive politics. So these are some of the elements that would need to be abided by and clear steps that would need to be taken in order to maintain European Union bilateral colla collaboration with the Burundian government. Um, I think that the, the Burundian government, uh, we, we believe that the Burundian government will want to engage in these con in this mediation or this negotiation or discussions with the European Union. Um, the government is concerned about the withdrawal or the suspension of, of support from its international partners. Um, in a response to the UN uh, Security Council resolution, one of the points mentioned by, by the Burundian government was their invitation and they were urging um, international partners to resume their assistance to the country. And I think this is a sign that financial pressures are indeed uh, taking their toll on the Burundian government. Um, so what I think we, we need to note um, in this apparent resumption of international consens consensus and, and pressure um, are some concerns and questions that remain. Um, um, you know, everybody des desires a dialogue um, in, in Burundi, but the question is what kind of dialogue is expected? Um, you know, if you, if you look at the resolutions and the communiques that have been issued in the past few weeks, um, people continue to delegate the responsibility of the mediation to the East African community with Uganda at the helm of this particular process. Um, and this came from the African Union, the European Union, the United Nations, and of, of course um, the, the U.S., who, which continues to support regional initiatives. And I think this is, is really nice in theory, but in the past few months what we've seen is the inability of the East African community member states um, to set aside their uh, individual foreign policy imperatives to reach a consensus on how to move forward with the crisis in Burundi. What I think is also uh, problematic is that there seems to be um, clear differences between the technocrats within the institution of the East African community um, and the heads of states. Uh, if, if we look, for instance, at um, the you know, observers who went to uh, monitor the elections, um, their sense for that was that the process was definitely not free and fair um, and was flawed in, in many ways. Um, but there's been an implicit um, acquiescence or acceptance, I should say, an implicit acceptance uh, from the member, at least the heads of states of of the East African community on the results of the elections with the exception, of course, of Rwanda, which has voiced its opposition to Nkurunziza's third term uh, on numerous occasions and have recently, uh, President Kagame made very strong statements about the violence that was taking place in Burundi. Um, another issue um, with the EAC-led mediation is that um, uh, you know, 
President Museveni has been tasked with leading the mediation, um, but for the past few months, his um, defense minister, uh, Dr. Kiyonga, has been the one um, visiting uh, the Rwandan government to discuss about how to move forward with the mediation. And, and while he's, you know, his continued involvement with the government is to be con commended, um, you know, there are some questions about to what extent is he equally engaging with the opposition. Um, and, and if he's not engaging equally with the opposition, then what kind of neutral mediator can he be? And the question remains, um, with President Museveni himself busy with his re-election, uh, will he continue to delegate the task of, of, of hosting or, or engaging with the government um, to his defense minister, or will he take um, back the responsibility once a date is set? So despite uh, Kenya's envoy, uh, Mr. Nyaga, who recently qualified the Ugandans' efforts as first class, um, the current situation on the ground with the increased escalation of violence will probably say otherwise. And I think it's, it's important to be, to be clear about what we expect from the mediation and, um, and then what also um, is going to be the relationship between the inter-Burundian dialogue and the international mediation. And the reason why I highlight this, light, this last point um, is that the government called the inter-Burundian uh, dialogue almost as a substitute to foreign intervention to mediation following, immediately following the elections. What the African Union, the United Nations, and the European Union appear to be calling for is the recomposition of this inter-Burundian dialogue by demanding a genuine and inclusive inter-Burundian dialogue. So I think the wording is important. They are encouraging the inter-Burundian dialogue as long as it is genuine and inclusive. And we know that when they say inclusive, they also mean people that are currently living outside of the country. Yet, as I've mentioned earlier, on the 23rd, the people forming this particular commission um, are members of various groups in, in, in the country that are not necessarily representative of the more forceful opposition. That is not to say, however, that an organization like SMARED is in fact representative of all dissenting views in Burundi, another thing that, I, that, that should be mentioned. Um, what the government seems to suggest, and I can be wrong, but what the government seems to suggest that the inter-Burundian dialogue would be taking place concurrently to the international mediation. So we need to have some sort of clarity on um, what is going to be the relationship between those two processes. Are they going to be parallel? Are they going to cross at one point? And what would be the utility or what would be the role, I should say, of the inter-Burundian dialogue in international mediation that would possibly take place in Kampala uh, as preferred by the Burundian government or a place like Addis Ababa, which has been called by um, members of the opposition and mentioned by uh, various international organizations. Another question about um, the recent communiques from um, the African Union, the European Union, and the UN is the insistence on both, and I quote, the spirit and the letter of Arusha, which is mentioned in most of these communiques and resolutions. And when we talk about the spirit and letter of Arusha, and we're obviously talking about President Nkurunziza's current mandate, is, are these um, communiques questioning um, the legitimacy of President Nkurunziza's mandate? Um, this is going to be a question, of course, to address as um, many uh, in the opposition and civil society organizations, of course, are arguing that President Nkurunziza's mandate is not legitimate and should be something that would be on the agenda of international mediation. Some actors I've spoken to uh, believe that given the situation on the ground, um, it is very possible that President Nkurunziza's third mandate um, should be accepted as is so they could move forward for more inclusive government. Um, so again, you know, what, what will be on the agenda of this particular um, uh, mediation? Another question that, that, that should be asked is who is part or who should be part of this inclusive dialogue? Um, SNARED, um, you know, obviously has a lot of members in its organization that are currently uh, listed on arrest warrants um, issued by the government. Now, there, are, there is a precedent in, in Burundi for putting aside some of the criminal investigation in the name of mediation and negotiation. Arusha is one of them. Uh, the ceasefires that were signed with the CNDFDD 
and later on with the FNL are another example. The caveat with this, however, is that what we would continue to see in, in Burundi is um, this, this, this um, idea that in the name of negotiations, you continue to have uh, impunity. And I'm not necessarily saying that it's something that should be uh, eliminated or something that should be avoided at all costs, but then the Burundian people would then have to come to terms with how to then hold people accountable for the crimes that have not only been committed in the recent months, but also in the previous years and previous decades. Um, and I think impunity is one of the things that, that if you ask Burundian, will we'll tell you uh, very honestly um, that they'd like to, to move past and, and see um, a certain level of accountability from government uh, officials and, um, and rebel groups, of course. Another question that I that I am puzzled with and I'm trying to, to 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 understand is what is the expected outcome of the mediation? Um, is the opposition and when I say opposition, I really use this term very loosely because there are various interests in the opposition, um, and and the opposition is, is not necessarily represented all in Snahed. But is the opposition um, expected a transitional government? So, you know, the, the Burundi just came out of transition. Um, uh, is are we looking for a government of national unity that is not the current government that we have at the moment that's been uh, put together by by the CND FDD? Um, are we looking to include members of the Snared within the government? Um, are we looking to do a redo of the certain elections? Or are we going to expect a status quo, which obviously is not sustainable given the increased level of violence as a result of, of the status quo that we've seen in the past few months? I also want to point the, the one of the aspects that is often not questioned enough in our recent um, analysis of, of, of the situation of, in Burundi is the reality of, of armed groups um, that, is, that are in, the armed groups are increasingly threatening the security of, of, of Burundi. I think we can uh, you know, give room, plenty of room for what the government has done wrong in the past few months and continues to do wrong. Um, continued impunity, a continued violence and, and torture despite um, allegations of the contrary. I think there's been enough documentation of um, uh, by international organizations um, of what is going on in, um, at the hand of the government. But the reality is that, as I was mentioning a bit earlier, the opposition is, is fractured um, and is divided. Um, you do have an armed opposition and a political opposition and with different links depending on the individuals between the two. Um, and the political opposition, which is embodied by by Snared to a certain extent, also involves CSOs, which in reality should not have a political mandate. But on the armed side, you also do not have a single command, which um, has contributed, um, and I think it's, it's important to note, to increase chaos and security in, in Burundi. So uh, this armed opposition not only needs to be acknowledged, but also needs to be unnoticed. Uh, put on notice, excuse me, um, as they are also involved in, in, in violation of human rights, um, you know, in, in um, you know, targeting uh, government officials and targeting, um, uh, you know, security uh, personnel of the country. So we find ourselves in Burundi in this situation where, uh, you know, the good guys and bad guys uh, sometimes are difficult to, to identify, but most importantly in a situation that leaves the population in, in a constant state of uncertainty. Now, the government will continue to say that most of the uncertainty um, is taking place in the capital. And in fact, you know, being in, in Bujumbura very recently, and pe many people who visited will tell you that in the daytime, things continue to look as if they're normal, and particularly downtown uh, part of the country. But there are certain people who live in, in specific neighborhoods who then have to be home by a self-imposed curfew uh, in order to remain safe. And most importantly, we continue to have difficulties um, understanding what goes on in the countryside. There are a few citizen reporters who give us some information about political tensions that are taking place in the countryside. And this despite um, uh, statements by the government that the countryside is completely at peace and that they are, for the most part, um, not willing to get away, uh, involved in, in the political opposition that is, is taking place in Bujumbura. But the reality is that the tensions are there and that you still have about 200,000 people um, outside of Burundi at the moment and continued 
outflow. Yes, you do have some people who are returning to Burundi, but you have actually um, a net outflow of population continuing to go to, to Tanzania and countries like Rwanda. And what I think is most concerning about the refugees in, in Tanzania, as I've mentioned in the, in the past few, few months, is that my understanding is many of them um, have re had recently returned to Burundi with the hope of stability and now have returned again to Tanzania with no uh, belief that they will ever return to, to the country. So as we look at the situation, I think what's, what's very important is to keep the momentum of, of the international community and regional actors. Um, we've had many statements from um, the African Union in the past few weeks, and we've had a resolution from the um, United Nations, but what we haven't had is an East African Community Summit, an East African Community uh, Communique on what they intend to do and what as an organization they hope to see as the outcome of these said mediation that have not yet started. Um, so if the East African community is the, remains the institution that everybody's going to rely on for, to mediate um, this particular crisis, then we will want to see much more vocal leadership uh, coming from the EAC and again um, a, a discussion or at least a clarity on who will be then involved in the nitty-gritty details of this particular mediation. Will it be the Defense Minister of Uganda? Will it be President Museveni himself? Um, and I think lastly another point to another point to highlight is when will this um, mediation take place? We are discussing who should be a part of it. We are discussing um, where it should take place and what should be on the agenda, but most importantly, we need to also um, figure out timing. On the one hand, the government will have to engage in, the, in conversations with the European Union with regards to Article 96, um, and that has to do mostly with um, uh, bilateral assistance between the European Union and Burundi, and it has to do with the government's ability to be solvent and can continue to, be, to pay its bills through um, this, um, this financial assistance. But on the other side, we're also talking, and most importantly, about the political dialogue that needs to take place. And my opinion on this situation is that the sooner the better, and I think that's just the, the, the position of most people who are following the situation. There's been times when people have been able to discuss and we've seen a de-escalation in the violence. And the longer we see both parties discussing the possibility of mediation, but not necessarily being in the same room together, we have a risk of seeing this increased uh, violence in the country. Um, I really hope that these um, mediation will take place before the end of this year. Uh, we are currently approaching the end of November, which doesn't give us much time before we enter a new year. Um, and the longer this takes place, the longer we drag this process on, uh, the more concerns we should have about the ability of the armed opposition to find the resources to arm itself and to increasingly destabilize the stability and the safety of, of the, the city, uh, Bujumbura, but also increasingly other parts of the country. And this despite the efforts of the government to, um, to, to disarm the population, whether peacefully or forcibly.